You consume it daily. You go through more than you probably realize. You are literally made of it. But how much do you really know about water? Join me, Lake Story Water, and my droid, H2O, as we travel in search of the science behind water and water-related concepts. This is Story of Water. Imagine that an alien species landed on Earth. The aliens, as it turns out, are very similar to us. They drink water, they eat the same foods we do, and they live in homes similar to us. Now imagine that these aliens are trying to start a colony here on Earth. They begin by building homes right next to ours. They tap into our plumbing to use our water. They start planting crops on our farms. They purchase food from our grocery stores. It turns out, however, that they consume twice as much food and water as we do, and we begin running out of these things. We try to get them to leave, first through diplomacy, then through war, but the aliens actually have the technology of an impenetrable force field around them. How do you think this story ends? We die from a lack of resources, and the aliens completely take over human civilization. This is how the story of invasive species plays out. In this episode, we are going to focus on invasive species found in the Great Lakes watershed. Invasive species are non-native organisms in a particular area that harm the habitats they invade by altering those habitats. They cause economic, environmental, and ecological damage because they typically have few predators, can survive on a variety of foods, grow quickly, and reproduce in large numbers. They either consume or crowd out rival species. Over 180 non-native species have entered the Great Lakes. About two non-native species are discovered in the region each year. How do invasives get introduced into a new environment? Unfortunately, we only have ourselves to blame. People introduce invasives to new environments, often unintentionally. One of the most common ways invasive species have traveled to the Great Lakes is through ballast water. Huge shipping freighters have ballast tanks that they fill with water in order to lower their center of mass when not carrying cargo. This stabilizes the ship. Let me explain how with an analogy. Here's an experiment you can try at home. Take an empty plastic cup and place it in a tub of water. What happens? It tips over. Now, if you fill that cup about halfway with some water and place it in the tub, what happens this time? It stays steady. That's because the center of mass is now closer to the water level, so it won't tip over as easily. Here's how invasives hitch a ride. When a ship is traveling to load cargo, it fills its ballast tanks in order to ride lower in the water and be more stable. When ballast water is taken from the body of water the ship is in, say the Atlantic Ocean, organisms that live in the water are also taken in. When the ship gets to its port to pick up the cargo, it must empty the ballast tanks so they don't have too much weight. They empty the tank wherever they are now, say a port in Lake Michigan. When they empty the tank, the organisms from the Atlantic Ocean are now released into Lake Michigan. For most of the organisms, they can't survive the new environment. But for a dangerous few, they can survive, and they are the villains of this story. Dumping ballast water from other freshwater sources is now illegal in the Great Lakes. Invasive mussels came to the Great Lakes through ballast water from the Caspian Sea. Mussels disrupt the food web by eating an enormous amount of plankton. Plankton form the base of the food web and the loss of plankton causes a lack of food to move up the food chain. Animals that depend on plankton die, and animals that depend on those animals die, and so on and so on. Their fastest growth and reproduction rates result in a buildup of dense colonies of thousands of mussels. A common problem resulting from this is mussels clogging intake water pipes 
for places such as water treatment plants and power plants. Another unintended consequence of the mussels is that they decrease the water quality of the lakes where they are found. Mussels are filter feeders, meaning they filter plankton and other nutrients out of the water. A single mussel can filter up to one liter of water daily. This elimination of nutrients and plankton that float in the water causes lakes to become more clear. Clear waters allow sunlight to penetrate deeper and combined with the waste mussels produce, encourages a type of algae known as Cladophora to bloom. Cladophora harbors harmful bacteria which can make animals and humans sick. Lakes Michigan and Huron have been hit especially hard by the mussels, as evidenced by the increasing clarity of their waters. There are two types of invasive mussels, zebra and quagga mussels. Zebra mussels were first identified in the Great Lakes in 1986. Zebra mussels are the smaller of the two and are more triangular in shape. The amount of zebra mussels peaked around 2000 and their populations have been steadily declining since. The bad news, however, is that the quagga mussels have taken over. Quagga mussels were first found in the Great Lakes several years later in 1989. Quagga mussels are bigger and rounder in shape. They are partly responsible for the zebra mussel decline as quagga mussels outcompete and outreproduce the zebra mussels. In fact, a single quagga mussel can produce up to 1 million eggs per year. It is estimated that there are 950 trillion quagga mussels weighing a cumulative half billion pounds in Lake Michigan alone. According to my calculations, with that many mussels, the population can filter all the water in Lake Michigan in less than two weeks. Another invasive that hitched a ride in ballast water is the spiny water flea. Native to European and Asian water, the spiny water flea is a tiny zooplankton, or animal plankton, less than a half inch long. It gets its name from the sharp spines on its long tail that resemble barbed fishing hooks. The tail, or spine, makes up about 70% of its body length. It has one large black eye, four pairs of legs, mandibles, and a pair of antennae. The spiny water flea was first discovered in the Great Lakes in 1982. The spiny water flea disrupts the food web by eating phytoplankton or plant plankton. Because of its spines, there are few predators that will risk the pain from eating spiny water fleas. This results in more spiny water fleas, less phytoplankton, and less zooplankton since they don't have as much phytoplankton to eat. Less zooplankton leads to less food for small fish, and less food for larger fish that eat small fish, and so on and so on. Their population can also increase rapidly because they can reproduce through asexual reproduction, meaning that a male isn't needed to produce offspring. Another invasive that arrived in ballast water, this time from the Black Sea, is the round goby. The round goby is a fish that can grow up to 6 inches in length and is gray in color when young and develop black and brown blotches when older. It has frog-like eyes that protrude out. It looks very similar to a native fish, the sculpin, except for one difference. A round goby has one fused pelvic fin, while a sculpin has two separate pelvic fins. Another consequential difference is that a round goby can spawn up to 6 times per year which results in more round goby than sculpin offspring. The round goby was first observed in the Great Lakes in 1990. The round goby causes multiple problems for native fish. First, it has a voracious appetite and eats the eggs of other fish. Second, the round goby has a heightened ability to detect movement. This gives it an advantage over native fish because it can hunt for prey in low light conditions and at night, things some native fish can't do. Third, the round goby is very aggressive. A consequence of this is that it will drive out other native fish from prime spawning areas. A round goby will chase and even bite a sculpin if it comes too close. The rest of the time, 
A round goby tends to stay motionless on rocks in shallow areas of water. Remember the zebra mussels? Well, another reason for their decline has been the round goby. Round gobies are one of the few fish that eat zebra mussels. Essentially, it took two invasives to get rid of this one invasive. Two wrongs did not make a right in this case. Ballast water isn't the only way invasives get to their destination. Some are intentionally released into the environment. Take the case of the rusty crayfish. This crayfish was a popular choice for live bait for many fishermen. Sometimes, when the day was done, any excess crayfish were just dumped into the lake. This happened in enough areas over enough times that this crayfish became a nuisance throughout the entire Great Lakes. The rusty crayfish grows to about 4 inches in length and its color can vary from greenish gray to reddish brown. The telltale marks, however, are the two rust colored spots on both sides of the back. It has four pairs of legs, antennae, and two orange and black tipped claws. It is native to the Ohio River Basin but was first introduced to the Great Lakes in the 1960s. Rusty crayfish are aggressive. They cause problems for native crayfish by driving them out of their habitats under rocks and making them more vulnerable to fish predation. Rusty crayfish also cause problems for native fish because not only will they eat fish eggs, they aren't afraid of most native fish, so their aggressiveness scares away these fish. Rusty crayfish also decrease plant abundance, likely through the destruction of some aquatic plants. In many areas, there are no longer native crayfish as the rusty crayfish has completely taken over. Without human involvement, species are prevented from leaving their home environments by natural barriers. One such example is Niagara Falls. Any animals coming from the sea wouldn't be able to make it past the falls. However, people have a tendency to alter nature. In order for ships to get around Niagara Falls, the Welland and Erie Canals were built in the 1820s to connect the Great Lakes to the Atlantic. Unfortunately, this also allowed harmful species to bypass the falls. One such species that came from the Atlantic to wreak havoc on the Great Lakes is the nightmarish sea lamprey, which was found in all Great Lakes by 1938. The sea lamprey is a two-foot-long, eel-like, jawless fish with a dark top side and light bottom side. The scariest part is its sucker-like mouth lined with multiple rows of sharp teeth and a razor-sharp tongue. This parasite feeds by attaching itself to a host fish with its suction cup mouth and digging in with its teeth. Its sharp tongue then burrows into the flesh of the host fish and feeds off the blood of that fish. The host fish typically dies either from loss of blood or from an infection related to the wound. One lamprey can kill up to 40 pounds of fish over its lifetime. Typically, the lamprey attach to larger fish, such as trout, whitefish, and salmon. This eliminates top predators in the food web, allowing for smaller fish populations to become too big for the environment to handle and causing issues going down the food web. Lamprey population has the potential to grow exponentially for two reasons. The first is they have no natural predators in the Great Lakes. The second is that a single lamprey can lay up to 100,000 eggs at a time. A growth in lamprey population also allowed another non-native species to flourish. The numbers of alewife and Atlantic fish were able to increase greatly since the lamprey reduced the numbers of large predator fish that could eat the alewife. People create barriers they think will keep invasive species away, but sometimes it is nature that alters people's plans. This is illustrated with the story of the Asian carp. The term Asian carp actually refers to four species of carp that originated in Asia, bighead, black, grass, and silver. They were imported by U.S. fish farmers in the 1970s for use in their aquaculture ponds. When flooding occurred, the carp were able to escape the ponds and ended up in the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River has acted like a freeway for the fish to expand its range throughout the U.S. Although currently not in the Great Lakes, 
a silver carp has been caught in waterways less than 10 miles from Lake Michigan. Since the silver carp species has made the closest approach to the Great Lakes, let's focus on that one. To put it mildly, the silver carp is one ugly fish. It is silver in color and laterally compressed or flattened from side to side. They have a large upturned mouth and their most distinguishing feature is the location of their eyes, which actually sit below the line of the mouth. When viewed from the side, it looks as if its head was attached upside down. All Asian carp are voracious eaters and grow quickly, growing up to 3 feet long and 60 pounds. Silver carp eat extraordinary amounts of plankton that small native fish and native mussels depend on. A female can lay up to 5 million eggs per year. Because of their physical size and numbers, and the absence of any predators, they easily outcompete other fish vital for keeping a functioning ecosystem. One other major problem with silver carp is that they have the tendency to jump out of the water when startled by noises, such as that from a boat motor. Picture boating through a river when all of a sudden hundreds of 60-pound fish start jumping up to 10 feet in the air over your boat and possibly right into you. Silver carp have caused serious injuries to boaters who get hit with flying carp. If you're interested, there are numerous videos on YouTube that show this happening. What can and is being done to control the spread of invasive species? Sometimes invasive mussels and invasive plants attach to the bottom of small fishing boats. When a boat is taken out of a lake and brought to another lake, it can transfer invasives such as mussels and spiny water fleas to that new environment. The simplest way to prevent spread in this manner is to clean your boat, trailer, and any other equipment that came in contact with the water. Round gobies are actually very easy to catch with standard fishing equipment. I've found that using a small artificial soft bait such as the gulp fish fry works great. Find a shallow area where gobies are known to live, attach a small hook and sinker to your line, and drop your line in until it hits the bottom and wait. Give a few tugs every now and then to move the bait and attract the gobies. Just make sure that any fish caught are indeed gobies. Remember to look for the single pelvic fin. And dispose of them and not return them to the lake. Rusty crayfish can be caught with traps that can be purchased at most sporting goods stores, or if you are a do-it-yourselfer, you can find plans online to build your own. No matter what method you use, these traps all work essentially the same. Adding bait such as a hot dog or other piece of meat will attract crayfish through a small funnel opening, and once they are in, they will not be able to get out of that opening. As with the round gobies, make sure they are rusty crayfish. Remember, look for the two red spots on the back sides. And dispose of them, and don't return them to the lake. Sea lamprey have been effectively neutralized with chemicals known as lamprosides. Lamprosides are released into rivers where lampreys spawn, and they kill the lamprey larvae, before they can mature into adults. The sea lamprey is one invasive species whose numbers are declining. To prevent the spread of Asian carp, electric barriers have been installed in the Chicago Shipping and Sanitation Canal, which connects Lake Michigan to the Illinois River. These barriers deliver an electric current that essentially creates an electric field that when an Asian carp comes in contact with, it provides a sufficient enough shock to deter it. Just knowing about different invasive species is a good start in the battle against them. If you encounter an invasive, remove it from the environment and report it to your local DNR. In the end, the best way to control invasive species is to prevent them in the first place, so supporting invasive species legislation is another important step we all can take. Lake Storywater here. Are you interested in starting a podcast but don't know where to start? Well, I was in your boat too when I came to Anchor.fm. Anchor has many tools to help you start a podcast. They help record and edit your podcast, they distribute your podcast, and they provide some opportunities to make money as well. And the best part is it's free. So try it today. Download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor.fm to get started. 
Thanks for joining us on Story of Water. If you liked what you heard, why not subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast provider? Let your friends and family know about it as well. Connect with us and listen directly at www.story-of-water.com. Check out the blog or email us feedback. If you really enjoyed the show, become a Patreon supporter. Just click the donate button on our website. Remember, stay hydrated. See you next time on Story of Water.